take your Bible tonight, if you would please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 22, for our scripture reading, Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew 22, we're going to read verses 34 through 40 of Matthew chapter 22, and we'll read the verses responsively, begin together on 34 and alternating until we end together on verse 40 of Matthew chapter 22. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing pleased to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 34 of Matthew 22. Ready? But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. I pray, God, that you will uh, prepare the hearts of each of us that we're ready to hear from your word tonight. Thank you for the good music this evening. Lord, thank you for the message that is in the songs that we sing. It's been a blessing to us tonight, and I pray it's been a blessing to you as well. Now, Lord, I pray you'll be with those who sing the special, and may we listen carefully. May you minister to us and make our hearts good ground that the Word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Okay. 
Good. Yeah. 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 Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer tonight, and Lord, we ask you to speak to our hearts this evening. Lord, I ask for your help as we bring the message this evening that I can be clear in the truth that we're going to present. Lord, I pray that you'll not only help me to be a spirit-led preacher, but help the people tonight to be spirit-filled listeners. And the Lord, that the Spirit of God would take the truth home to each of our hearts tonight. And that we would really grasp the true meaning of the greatest commandment that you told this young lawyer about. And Lord, I pray that tonight at the end of the service we'll be able to walk out of this building and say I really do desire to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, and all my mind. Help us to grasp that truth this evening and I'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. The, there's many people that try to discern what oftentimes is the root problem in churches. Why members are inactive in their attendance. Why oftentimes the, the number on the roll doesn't come close to matching the number in attendance. Why people are unfaithful in their giving absent in their service, often absent of the fruit of the Spirit in their life, and often the mind of Christ or Christian thinking is absent in their life outside of church. They, I watch Christians who handle their children and their marriages and their conflicts and their finances and their difficulties often in no different way than those who do not know Christ. And you think, what is the root problem? And I think probably the root problem is they've never learned to keep the first and greatest commandment. That is to love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and all their mind. We can't just have the head knowledge. It must be a heart knowledge. It must be something that gets into the core of our being. Understand what we believe matters, but you have to believe it in your heart. You have to believe it in the core of your being. If you just believe it in your head, it doesn't matter. You understand the Pharisees had a great set of beliefs. They could quote scripture, more Scripture than anybody of their day. They had a great head knowledge of God. They knew the Bible. But Jesus had a definite problem with them. What did He say? They draw nigh to Me with their lips, their mouth, but their heart is far from Me. In fact, here in our passage, if your Bible is open to Matthew 22, I want you to notice something that You can jot this down that not everyone who says they're a follower of Christ is a follower of Christ. Not everyone who says they're a follower of Christ is a follower of Christ. It's interesting here that the Pharisees heard in verse 34 that He put the Sadducees to silence so they're gathered together and they're going to take their shot at Jesus. There was always a competitive spirit between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And certainly, going after Jesus would be no exception. And so one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question. What's the next two words after asking a question, church? Tempting him. So he's tempting him and he's saying, what's the next word? Master. How can you call him Master and want to tempt him in the same breath? That sure doesn't seem like it goes together, does it? How can I call him master? How can I call him teacher? And and my intent is to trip him up. My intent is to try to get him to stumble. And he asked him a question. Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? I want you to turn over a few chapters. If you're in Matthew there, 22, go over to Matthew 26 with me, would you please? Matthew 26 is a familiar scene. Jesus is in the garden. He's praying. 
He has, he has gone a little farther and prayed and come back and found the disciples sleeping. He does that several times. And finally in verse 45, he said, He cometh to his disciples and saith to them, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Well, who's coming? Judas Iscariot. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, the same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master. Wait a minute. You're calling him Master and you're about to betray him? You're calling him Master and you're, you've sold him out already for 30 pieces of silver? And of course he kissed him and they laid hands on Jesus and took him away. Let me ask you a question. Here's men that say they were following Jesus, but they weren't following Him. They did not want to do as He said. Everything about Judas would have looked that Jesus was His Master. It would have looked like Jesus was His teacher. But Judas was not following Jesus' plan. He was following Judas's plan. He was not living his life the way Christ would have him to live it. He was living the way Judas wanted to live it. He did not care about doing what Jesus wants. He cared about doing what Judas wants. So not everybody who says they're a follower of Jesus or is a follower of Jesus. Go back a little to your left in the book of Matthew, to Matthew chapter 7. Let me give you a second thought tonight. Not everyone who has apparent spiritual gifts is a true follower of Jesus. Not everyone who has spiritual gifts, I should say apparent spiritual gifts, is a follower of Jesus. Notice what Jesus said in verse 21 of Matthew 7. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works and then will I profess unto them I never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity here's people who did apparently some real spiritual things they prophesied in his name now that's not necessarily telling the future but prophecy in the Bible can be a foretelling, a foretelling of the future, but it also can mean a foretelling of the truth. So they preached in His name. Not only did they preach in His name, but it says that in, their name, in your name we cast out devils, and in thy name we did many wonderful works. I hear, I hear wonderful works. I see great power, but I don't see anything about God's power here. I see... Wonderful works, but nobody talks about a wonderful relationship. And what Jesus says to them is, I never knew you. And by the way, make it clear, these are not people that once knew Him and now don't know Him. Not ones He once knew. Jesus said, of all those the Father had given unto me, have I lost none. He says, yeah, my, my, he said you, you, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall... Never perish. There's no such thing. And you say, well, then people lose their salvation. If they can, there's no example of it in the Bible. Anywhere. That that's ever happened. But what Jesus is really saying here when He says, depart from Me, I never knew you, it's a, it's a phrase that means you were never My personal property. That's interesting, isn't it? When you think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when it says we are not our own, we've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are God's. They don't belong to us anymore. We belong to Him. So he says you were never a part. They were never a follower, a true follower of Jesus Christ. So, how is a true follower of Jesus Christ known? He's known by obedience. 
Jesus said this. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Jesus said this, if you love me, keep my commandments. You'll be obedient. Look at the Gospel of John chapter 10 with me. Will you turn there please? John 10. John 10 and verse number 26. Jesus is speaking to people here and He says, But ye believe not, John 10, 26, because ye are not of My sheep. As I said unto you, My sheep hear My voice, and I know them, and they follow Me. A follower of Jesus Christ makes a conscious decision that they're going to follow the commands of Jesus Christ. That we're going to follow the Word of God. That I'm going to obey what God tells me to do. That I'm going to... Listen, when I obey God and I live the way He tells me to live, and I do so in the power of His Spirit, then I overcome sin, I overcome stubborn habits, I overcome addictions, I have victory in my life. Sin does not have dominion, power, authority in my life anymore. So Jesus tells this young lawyer that there's two great commandments and His responsibility is to keep them. Go back to Matthew 22 with me, will you please? Look what Jesus told this young man. Jesus said unto him, here's the greatest commandment in the law, the great commandment in the law, verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And this is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What I think Jesus was telling this young man is this, listen carefully, your first responsibility is to God. Your first responsibility is to God. My first responsibility is not to my wife. My first responsibility is not to my children. My first responsibility is not to my church. My first responsibility is not to my job. My first responsibility is not to my country or my government. My first responsibility is to God. Your first responsibility is to God. Now, we know that We are a man is a three part being. We are spirit, soul, and what? And body. We're a three part being. We call that a trichotomy. We know that when when the day God told Adam and Eve, the day ye eat of the tree, you'll surely die. They didn't die physically. What happened? Their spirit died. They still had soul and body. And from that point on, everyone who is born is born with a soul and a body and a dead spirit. What happens when you must be born again, what has to be born again, what has to come alive again, is your spirit. And so God quickens that spirit because it's His spirit, God's spirit, that bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That part of man that communicates with God is your spirit. That's why the natural man, the unsaved man, he can't fellowship with God. He doesn't understand the things of God. He can't know the things of God. Why? That part of him that communicates with God is dead. And so he can't understand the things of God. He's spiritually discerned, the Bible says. He's spiritually disabled until that spirit is brought to life. Now once that spirit is brought to life, you understand the spirit now is brought to life in us. Now we're spirit, soul, and body, but here's the problem. We have been led most of our life by our soul. Soul has been in control. The soul is the outer man. The spirit is our inner man. There is an inner man and there is an outer man. The inner man is our spirit, the spirit of God. The outer man is our soul and our body. Now, the soul is our heart, as Jesus mentions here. What's our heart? That's our emotions. Our soul, it's what I want, my my desires, my will. 
and my mind what I think. So, but listen, when God said our responsibility is to love Him, He didn't say, love me with your spirit. Because our spirit, when it's brought alive by God, listens to the things of God. He's commanding us to love Him with our outer man. Our soul, our heart, our soul, and our mind. That's the outer man. We know that Paul said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. My spirit loves the Bible. My spirit loves church. My spirit loves to please God. It's that outer man I got trouble with. What I want. What I feel. What I think. But the command is to love the Lord the God with our outer man. Because when we love Him with our heart and our soul and our mind, then our outer man has been broken and the inner man shines through. Let's look at these tonight. I want to help you. Love God with all of our heart. That means we are to love God with all of our emotional being. Loving God with all of our emotional being. The heart is the seed of our emotions and passions. Did you know that emotional highs and lows often lead us to indulging in selfish sin? When we're emotionally drained and we're emotionally tired, we get very, very selfish. And we're prone to sin when that happens. God's Spirit then, speaking to our spirit to lead us, is grieved and quenched. Why? Because He can't lead us. Our emotions are leading us. And when the emotions are leading us, God's Spirit is not leading us. Sinful habits and addictions are often fueled by unchecked emotions. You see, God is saying, when you love Me with all your heart, your emotions have to come under the control of the Spirit of God. And I've got news for you. Your outer man won't like that. It's used to being in control. You know, something that's used to being in control doesn't like to be controlled. I've, I've watched, I've never done it and uh, don't care to, but I've watched them break horses. What is the horse is used to being by himself, calling the shots. But you throw a person on his back and you put somebody trying to tame him, he bucks and kicks and does everything he can. He's not, he doesn't want that. I want someone to control me? No, I'm not want that. And when the Spirit of God begins to speak to you, listen, then there's a battle that goes on. The flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh, and these two are contrary one to the other. There's a battle going on. Now here's what happens. God uses circumstances of life to break that outer man. We don't like that. Now we, we know, here's the promise. What's the promise? Romans 8, 28. That all things will work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. So God works those things together. Now, if He has to work them together for good, we, that means we're going to look at them and we don't see them as good. And when we don't have things that don't look good to us, we don't want any part of it. But we have to see it as God's seeing it. He's designing those circumstances to break our outer man. We get upset and we get discouraged and we get frustrated when things of life don't go the way we think they should, and, 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 and so we get upset with God. Because we're not looking at it the way He looks at it. But God is, God is orchestrating the circumstances of life to get us to break that outer man, to be able to put our emotions under His control, because He's trying to conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. 
that's what, that's what all these circumstances are. You say, man, why'd this happen today? Why'd this happen? Man, everything's cutting me today. I can't take any more of this. I can't take one more thing. We're not looking at it the way God's looking at it. If you will not learn to not yield to your emotions, you'll... If you'll learn not to yield to your emotions then you can love God with all of your heart. But you cannot love God with all your heart if you are living by your emotions. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Secondly, love the Lord your God with all your soul. The soul here is talking about our human will. It's what I, what I want to do, what I want to be, or I want, what I want to have. My human will. But I'm to love God with all my soul. That means I have, to, I have to bring what I want, what I want to be, what I want to have, what I want to do, and I have to put that in submission to what God wants me to be, what God wants me to do, and what God wants me to have. I have to give a complete sacrifice of my will. From experiencing life as I want it to life as God wants me to have it. Most of you in the room. How many in the room tonight, you're, you're over 20 years of age? Let me see your hand. Okay, that's most of us. How many raise your hand and say, you know what? My life has gone exactly as I thought it would. When I was 10, when I was 15, I used to, uh, we used to have the paper back home and they would always have athletes of the week and, and generally they were seniors in high school. And part of it, they'd ask them questions, you know, your favorite color and your favorite this and that. But they always ask them the last question, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I always laughed when I read that. I, I would imagine most 18-year-olds, they, when they say what they'll be doing when they're 28 years old, I, I would doubt anybody got it right. Did you understand? Especially if you're a Christian. Because you know why? His thoughts are not my thoughts, and his ways are not my ways. And, and life, what, what God has for me may not be what I want. You see, we all, we all have plans for our lives. Now, nobody said, I don't know what I'll be doing. Everybody had a plan. And we all have plans, whether it's short term, here's what I'm doing tomorrow. Here's what I'm doing this week. You know, we have plans. We have an appointment tomorrow night. We have uh, going to the meeting on Tuesday. We make plans. But I don't know if that's what God's going to have me do or not. We have long-term plans. But do I consciously make those plans to line up with whatever God's plans are for me? Do we even give that a thought? Do I make my plans with the idea of what would God have me to do or be or to have? We see something we want to do or get and we don't, we don't say, well, let's, let, let me ask God whether I should have this or not or let me make sure this is what God wants for me. We just say, hey, do we have money? Can we afford this? Okay, let's get it. And we have no, no consultation as to whether God wants us to have it or not. What our soul wants often is in conflict with God's desires for my life. But you see, I can't love God with all my soul unless I force my desires, my human will, to yield to God's desires, God's will for my life. If I don't do that, I'm not loving God with all my soul. See, we, 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 we think in our own pride that if I, can, if I can do what I want, 
be what I want, and have what I want, I'm going to be content. I'm going to be satisfied. And so, when God brings something different in, and it's not what we wanted, it's not what we wanted to be, not what we wanted to do, we're frustrated. In some cases, we get angry. And the truth is, we're, we're, we're letting... We're, we're so intent on following our way, we get kind of bothered because God's way is not our way. Don't we? But God's ways are not our ways and His, way, His thoughts are not my thoughts. In fact, His ways are much higher than my ways. His thoughts are much higher than my thoughts. And I have to yield to what He wants to do. You see, God, what God is wanting to do is break that outer man so the inner man can shine through. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. There's no light. Who's the only light in us? Yeah, it's only Jesus Christ. He's the light of the world. Well, He's in the inner man. And as long as the outer man's in control, the outer man's not broken and in submission to God, loving God with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind, no one will ever see Christ in my life. No one will ever see Christ in your life. We have to allow that outer man to be broken, to be in submission to God. When we love, begin to love God with all our soul, then our soul loves God. And, and, and it begins to desire what God wants us to do, what God wants us to be, and what God wants us to have. And then the Spirit of God is free to guide us and lead us and shine through us to other people. And He guides our decisions. Should, should I sin? Should I indulge in this habit? Should I yield to my addiction? That's, that's a struggle sometimes for the soul to determine. But it's not a struggle for the Spirit of God to determine. Not a struggle if we're yielded to the Spirit. It's easy to resist temptation and to resist sin if we are led by the Spirit. If you're, if you're led by the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what Scripture says. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. Love the Lord with all your heart, your emotion. Love the Lord with all your soul, your will, your desires. And then the last one, the Lord said, is love Him with all thy mind. Now listen, this is the most difficult of the three. The mind talks about our thought processes. When, we, when, you, when you and I, when we lose the battle to sin, it's lost first in our mind. In our you, Brother Currington said, before you ever did it, you thunk it. And, and the truth is, you thought it before you ever did it. So our mind needs to be under the influence of the inner man, the Spirit of God, as well as our soul and our heart. And that's the hardest, listen, the mind is the hardest area to bring under the control of the Spirit of God. It's unpoliced, it's often unregulated. You see, here's the, here's the issue. If, if someone is, lives by their emotions, it's easy to see it. Everybody here, if I say somebody just lives on their emotions, they're a real emotional being, you, you could almost think of somebody in your mind right now. You know somebody like that. If somebody is living, making their own decisions, their own desires, no regard for what God wants, I'm just doing what I want, you can pick those people out pretty good too. But when someone isn't thinking right and they're having thoughts that are not submitted to God, nobody knows. You can't see it. I know sometimes people say, oh, I know what they were thinking. No, you don't. Nobody here is going to read anybody else's mind. 
The mind is everybody's secret hiding place. And listen, I'm not, I'm not just talking about you know, immoral or dishonest or wicked thinking, though that happens. You can have a mind that's free of any wicked thoughts or immoral thoughts and yet still have a mind that is not under the control of God. Not, not thinking what God wants you to think. That's where, you know, what we have is we have spirit-led thoughts and we have our own thoughts. And sometimes they kind of mix together. Have you ever wondered, well, is this just what I think is I should do or is this what God wants me to do? Is this just something that I think should happen or is this what God thinks should happen? And we try, to, we try to sort out, I'm trying to discern, is this my thought or is this God's thought? Which, which is, it? is it? And by the way, it can be something good, but it may not be what God wants. That because there's goodwill and there is God's will. And, and you don't, I, I don't just want to do good things, I want to do God's will. And so what does God want? Well, here's, here's what you do. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Here's a, a tremendous verse that tells us something very, very important about the Word of God and our thoughts. If you're at Hebrews 4.12, you say amen. Okay, ready? For the Word of God is quick, that means it's alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now the Bible here is described as a very sharp instrument. Not, a, not just a sharp sword, it says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And so it pierces or divides between the spirit and the soul. Remember, the spirit is the inner man. The soul is the outer man. How do you discern between two? The Word of God is so sharp, it divides that. It divides it. What can we do to see that our mind is submitted to the Spirit of God? You have to allow your soul, your mind to be separated by the Word of God. That the regular decisions of our life are guided and, and, and regulated by Scripture. The Word of God is what shows you when your thoughts are not lining up with God's thoughts. Every one of us fight the thing, we, we, a situation, and you know what we do? We say, well, it seemed to me I should... Well, I just thought I should. Well, we talked it over and we thought the best thing. And, and, and nothing inherently wrong with that except where's God? Hey, how about, how about we, we, we go to the Word of God and let's spend some time, let's spend a few days in the Word of God and let's see what God gives us, if He'll show us whether this is what He wants or not. You have to apply His Word to the outer man. His thoughts are not my thoughts. It divides, did you notice, between the soul and the spirit, the outer man and the inner man. That's the joints and the marrow, the outside and the inside. And it's a discerner. It discerns the thoughts and intents of our heart. We can't even discern our own heart. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So the heart is deceitful. The heart will fool you. The heart won't always be honest with you. Don't follow your heart. Follow the Word of God. Now I want you to look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you please? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians 10. <clears throat> and notice... 
verse number 3. Let's start there, okay? Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The flesh is our outer man. Because he gives a parenthesis here, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that means fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. How does that happen? We casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Now watch this. And we bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We, we bring into captivity every thought Captive. You know what a captive is? A captive is a prisoner taken by force or strategy in a war. And it's always followed with by or to, like as a captive to the victor. Alright? So I'm to bring every thought as a prisoner taken by force and, and put that thought into captivity of God, and I give God the key. We bring every thought. I mean, I just, I just have to clear my mind. No, you don't. You need to submit your mind to Jesus Christ, to the authority of God's Word. Are my thoughts captive to the victor of the Spirit of God, the victor of the Word of God? Or is the inner man, the Spirit of God, is He captive to my thoughts? As I said earlier, God will use the circumstances of life to break that stubborn, selfish outer man. You know what the outer man wants to do? You know what our soul wants to do? It wants to do what he wants, what he feels, and what he thinks. We're used to being controlled and He wants to stay in control. And so we have to allow God through the circumstances of life and through the sharp cutting of the Word of God to break the outer man. Wound the outer, outer man. And you'll find that things which were hard to accept, things that we didn't like, we didn't care for that God brought into our life. Or just what God uses to let the inner man shine out to a world that's in darkness and without Jesus Christ. Don't we pray? Lord, may others see Jesus in me. You can't do that if the outer man isn't broken. If you're not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, that's the outer man. You're going to love God with the inner man. That's the Spirit of God. You'll delight in the law of the God after the inward man. That's, that's the Spirit of God. But it's the outer man that needs to yield. When circumstances are not what you would choose for yourself, accept God's truth. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. What's the purpose? To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That that's God's ultimate purpose for my life. That's God's ultimate purpose for your life. Jesus Christ became flesh. And though He was tempted just like we are, He made His outer man submit to the inner man. Jesus Christ, when He lived on this earth, He lived His life as a Spirit-filled, Spirit-led man. That's why the Bible says we should follow His steps. You can't ever say, well, I'm not Jesus. When people say, when I tell them how they ought to respond to something, how they should behave, well, that's Jesus, I'm not Jesus. No, but when Jesus walked, God wouldn't tell us to follow His steps and that He is our example, Jesus is our example, if He expects us to be God. 
He's saying he was our example to show us how to submit the outer man to the inner man. Philippians chapter 2, and we'll finish up. Philippians chapter 2. Would you look there, please? Philippians chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God's not treating you like you think He should. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Don't let your thoughts run wild. Accept your servant's role. He's the master, we're his servants. He can do with us as he pleases. And what he's doing is conforming us to his image. And we conform to his image by submitting our mind to him. Remember, we are not our own. So we need to quit acting like we are. We've been bought with a price. So it's a choice. Will I choose to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind? Your outer man will be broken. And so will stubborn habits and addictions. And then you're, be, you're free to be led by the inner man. Free to be led by the Spirit of God. And he, He'll have free reign in your life. You know what that does? That leads you to Philippians 2 where you're a servant and you want to live your life to serve others. Which brings you right into the second commandment. The first was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. The second's like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then you want to serve others. I'm not dealing with the second commandment tonight. Maybe I'll do that next week. But the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. I've, I have heard that preached often growing up. I've been in church for a few years. But you know, I'm not sure to my knowledge or my recollection, no one ever broke it down to say, what does that really mean? How does that really live out in my life every day? Now, the choice is yours. Will you choose to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? And that's not, that's not only a one-time decision, that's a decision I think you make every single day of your life. You purpose to do that. And then you'll help, and you'll love the Lord, and you'll want to serve others with your life. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Lord, I trust that folks have grasped it. This is, I realize this is something that is not pleasant for our outer man to hear. And Lord, I think sometimes we don't realize the, the struggle that we have with that outer man. We don't realize just how strong he is. But Lord, I really do desire to love you tonight with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. 
want my emotions to be under the control of the Spirit of God. I want my will, my desires, what I want to do, what I want to be, what I want to have to be under your control, Spirit of God. And I want my thinking, my thoughts, my plans, my thought processes to be yielded to you and the Word of God. And Lord, I pray others would have that same desire tonight. And we would have a church that loves the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, and all their mind.